It makes up 15% of all violent crime, yet often remains shrouded behind silence. Inside the dark world of domestic violence, also known as private violence and intimate terrorism, Rachel Louise Snyder's books include Fugitive Denim, a moving story of people in pants in the borderless world of global trade, and the novel What We've Lost is Nothing. She's been the recipient of an Overseas Press Award. She's an associate professor at American University. And the new book is No Visible Bruises, What We Don't Know About Domestic Violence Can Kill Us. And it was recently awarded the J. Anthony Lucas Work in Progress Award. Welcome, Rachel. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Man, this is an absolutely chilling book. And in many cases, women are um, uh, preparing for their own deaths. I-, I was told to ask you first, though, on your tour, you you had some experience with domestic violence or something? Oh, uh, the savage irony. Yeah, well, three weeks ago, I came home and uh, to a phone call that one of my closest friend's brothers had killed his wife and then killed himself. A, oh, my God. A family here that lives near me. My daughter is really close friends with one of their two daughters. And um, yeah, so I'm front line in my personal life with it right now. And it was it's just been unbelievable. Wow. <laughs> wow. Let me let me uh, start with this then, too. This has been uh, about a week ago, the 25th anniversary of the O.J. Simpson murder case. At the time, it appeared on a criminal basis. He got away with murder and attacked the reputation of the uh, victim. Have uh, How have things changed in your mind since that event? I guess in some ways they've changed a, a great deal. I mean, we didn't have a federal law against spousal abuse in this country until 1984, just a decade before Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman were killed. So if you look at it, if if you look at that view of history, we've made quite a lot of progress since then. Um, We're tracking it now. We have all kinds of trainings that are out there. We've learned a lot. But there are so many examples. And in fact, since 2017, the domestic violence homicide rate in this country has gone up 33%. It feels very much like a step forward, a step back, a step forward, a step back, if, if you're looking at it from my point of view. I don't know if you know this one, but I'll just do it quickly. We've had a, a woman right in the next town over in New Canaan, Jennifer Dulos, who uh, disappeared. And her husband, uh, who she had moved away from in fear of, uh, her, his blood was found mixed with hers in her house. Um, and he was seen at night disposing with his girlfriend 30 garbage bags. Their lawyer since has said that she wrote a 500-page uh, manuscript years ago, and they, they're calling it Gone Girl, that she uh, framed. She wants to frame her husband for her fake murder. Now it, they've changed it to revenge suicide, and they've said she was mentally ill and they, you know, used wow. heroin. And this, what do you think about this kind of stuff? <laughs> I've had so many people write to me about that case. It's really shocking. I mean, I you know, she had five children, right? Was it four or five? Five, five children, um, two sets of twins, yeah. and I have twins, so. Yeah, I have a daughter myself. I I mean, revenge, suicide, you're going to leave your children, an otherwise, par- uh, you know, a woman who's been in their lives and has never shown any sign. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. But, I, you know, it speaks to, I mean, all of these things speak to a sort of cultural, almost cultural appropriation of the experiences of women in this country, you know, even when we are credible, we are to be disbelieved, we are to be discounted, we are to be dismissed in whatever way we can. And I think, you know, one of the reasons I think the domestic violence homicide rate has risen since 2017 is retaliatory violence against, in particular, women's anger. And also, I would include men, men like you, men who are allies of, you know, women's rights and women's equality. I think we are all angry about about this. I think we are all angry in this moment. And so I think these things are, in some sense, rising to the level of, of the ridiculous. I mean, a, a, a suicide, what did you call it? Su- revenge, revenge suicide. Revenge suicide. Yeah, exactly. Before. And by the way, she moves her kid because she's in fear of what her husband might do, and then she's going to kill herself and leave them hanging. Yeah, yeah, and and leave them subject to an abuser. I mean, it's just, it's it, there's nothing about that scenario that makes <laughs> It's any pretty, thinking, it makes sense to any thinking person. Now, what I want to do is, is get a little bit uh, into the chilling nature of this. Um, you, you have this case of Rocky Moser, who was a guy who uh, ended up um, killing his family, basically. Um, and you almost get a sense that his wife is, is just awaiting her death. Can you tell us the story? And within that, why don't women leave? 
I mean, that's one of the things I want to, I sort of want to disrupt our, our national narrative in terms of that question. And I want to instead replace it with how can we protect this victim and why is this person violent in the first place? Like those are the two questions I'd like to replace it with. Okay. The story of Michelle Monson Mosier and her husband, Rocky Mosier, is in many ways a very typical story of domestic violence. She was 14 when they met. He was 24. She had two kids before the age of 17 with him. It's easy to dismiss that and say, well, my God, where were her parents? But her parents were very active in trying to get her away from him. And she said to them, you two divorced when I was a kid. I'm not going to raise my children in a broken home. They deserve to have their father. And if you try to force us apart, we're just going to take off. And as a parent, you know, that's a terrifying. You, can only, you only have so much control over your children, right? So they stayed together, and Rocky began to isolate her more and more from her family. He wouldn't let her work outside the home. He wouldn't let her have friends over. He said it was a bad influence on the kids. Um, they had a very gendered relationship. Like, you know, she took care of everything at home, and he worked outside the home somewhat unreliably or seasonably, so money was always tight. He would do things like take the kids. Uh, if he was mad at her for the night and they would go camping or they would go to a motel and she'd be frantic with worry. So he would coerce her and manipulate her through the children as a bargaining tool. At one point, he went out to the outskirts of Billings and got a rattlesnake and brought it home and kept it in a cage as a threat to her to sort of keep her in line. And he didn't have to beat her. She did later file an affidavit that said he had beat her many times in front of the kids, but he actually didn't have to beat her to control her. He controlled her through the children, through things like that snake. And eventually in the fall of 2001, he killed her when she was 23 years old and then killed the two kids and then killed himself. I, I was going to say, I mean, um, you, you said you were trying to change the narrative. But on that, why don't leave, though? The, the statistics in your book say that it takes seven or eight times to actually get away but that people should view it more as a process, right, because of the kids yeah. and the danger and all of these other factors. Yeah, leaving is a process, not an event. And when we, when we look at someone like Michelle Monson Moser and say, why didn't, why didn't she just leave? In fact, she was putting many things in place to leave. But leaving when you're in a situation as dangerous as hers is a year-long process. So, for example, they were living in a house that was owned by her father. And she had, she and her father had like cut this deal to put it only in her name so that eventually she could get Rocky out of the house. Rocky didn't know anything about that. Um, she was not allowed to work outside the home, but Rocky did let her take classes. So her plan was to take classes, earn her nursing degree, and be able to raise her kids and afford to raise her kids. But the state college where she went to school wouldn't give her financial aid because she was too young and didn't have enough years of tax records to show. So they said to her, well, you need to get married. She and Rocky had never married. They said, you need to get married and he'll claim you as a dependent and then you can qualify for financial aid. So she was forced by the system in some sense to actively marry someone that she was trying to leave. I mean, it's a, again, just a savage irony that we see this. And you know, her sister knew that the situation was terrible and her sister would say to her, go to California, we'll, we'll shave your head, we'll get you wigs, we'll cover you in tattoos. And she would say, where am I going to go that he's not going to find me? Jeez. She can't register the kids in school without, you know, both parents' signatures. She can't up and take them to a new state. He does have parental rights and father's rights. So there is literally nowhere she can go. She's got zero work history. She has zero access to money, right? He controlled most of their, the money in their home. So there's two different sets of things going on when victims don't just up and leave. One is the actual logistical steps like these that she can't physically leave. The other is this deep psychological underpinning to domestic violence where through years of corrosive verbal abuse, women just lose their sense of agency and their sense of self. I can give you an example from Michelle and Rocky. Rocky had left had videotaped them for years, all the family camping and fishing and doing things together. And so when they, when he killed them all, he had taken 14 hours of videotape and put it in the garage for the police or for the in-laws to find. And Michelle's father gave me copies of those videos and I watched them. And one of the things I noticed was over the years, Rocky would film her. She was very young. She was beautiful. She had a beautiful figure. 
and he would like film her starting at her feet and going all the way up her legs to her to her you know rear and he would say things like look at that look at that beautiful you know whatever whatever and in the beginning she would she would sort of joke around and be like cut it out stop it cut it out and then a couple of years in you could see them aging and you could see the kids getting older She's getting actually actively angry at him for doing that. He's still filming her in that way. And she's saying, stop it. Cut it out. Stop it. And he never does. Hmm. And in the summer before they were killed, on one of the very last videotapes, he does that same thing, films, and he's with the kids, and he points it out to the kids. Look, kids, look at your mama's legs. Look at that. And he says nothing. And you can see the erosion over the years of her lack of agency, her lack of just having any power at all Jeez. in that relationship. You're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell here on 1540 AM WADK in Newport. We'll be right back with our next segment. We're looking into can perpetrators become nonviolent? All right, we're back right here on 1540 WADK Newport. This is Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Our guest is Rachel Louise Snyder. She has a chilling new book out, No Visible Bruises, What We Don't Know About Domestic Violence Can Kill Us. Explain to me why there's so many of these uh, these men are narcissistic. How does that link up to this? I know. I mean, I don't know why they're narcissistic, but I I know that narcissism is a common trait among abusers. You know, when we think of abusers, I think that the stereotype that pops into our mind is some rageaholic guy that we would all recognize somehow. Uh-huh. And that's only about twenty percent or twenty five percent of the of the abusers that are out there statistically. The other, the vast majority of them, are people who comport themselves quite well in everyday life. They know. How to? Um, they know how to act at a job. They know how to act around, you know, other family members or friends. It's just that one person. And so, what researchers say is that that narcissism feeds into a sense of ownership, like that extends to their relationship or to their immediate family. That they feel perpetually um, shortchanged by not by not having their their contributions to the household recognized by not having their, their sort of greatness applauded mm. all the time. And, it, I mean, it's really fascinating. You begin to see it when you sit in on batterers' intervention groups, you know, guys who um, are there are court-ordered to batterers' groups and, you know, will talk about their abusive fathers but say things like, well, he wouldn't have been that way if my mom wouldn't have incited that abuse. Somehow, so they dismiss that even when they see it in other people. Is there some sort of underlying insecurity that that, that is behind the narcissism or controlling nature that, that all wraps up into this? Well, I think certainly there is there is underlying insecurity. I mean, I, I talked to a researcher named David Adams who who looked at this for his dissertation and found household work was kind of divided equally among both groups. That men did about twenty percent of the household work, but that the non-abusers knew that they were getting a good deal and were grateful for it. And the abusers felt perpetually under-recognized and that, and that they, they didn't feel that they were getting their due, essentially. And they feel like so, they're victims, too, don't they? They absolutely feel like they're victims. And they, and they have this narrative, too, of like, you'll often hear jailhouse calls that, that have a very similar script, and they'll say things like, you know, it's my love for you that makes me do this, or... You know, if I didn't if I didn't love you so much, I wouldn't have to keep you in line. So it's this really warped view of love and of ownership. And I think you're absolutely right that it is a deep, deep insecurity. I mean, you bring up Trump and his his worldview has to be manipulated by those around him because yeah. he's so sensitive and so fragile. That was the, another thing. I, is, is is he? I guess think, I think Rocky even. Well, you know, I love her with all my heart. OJ said that too. It's a weird th- yeah. mixture, isn't it? With this rage, and then yeah. I love her with all my heart. Sure. Yeah. You see it all the time when you watch movies, when you watch TV shows, when you watch. I mean, I, you know, growing up as a as a young girl, you know, I had Beauty and the Beast, and when you really look at the narrative of Beauty and the Beast, that it's a girl who is first owned by her father and then given as payment to a beast, right, for the stealing of a rose, it's incredibly warped, I think. Um, 
And it, you know, it underscores the idea that somehow love and violence are mixed up together. I actually had a, I was listening, I listen to a lot of heavy metal when I work out. <laughs> and I was listening to heavy, I think it was Bush a couple of months ago. And I thought, what if I could challenge all these rock bands who have love and violence in the same song to rewrite like that single lyric that, that is connecting love and violence. Like it really would like to start some sort of like Twitter, some sort of Twitter thing that like challenges these rock and roll bands to like rewrite the narrative. <laughs> Interesting. You probably put, throw that on rappers too. Yeah. Well, I don't even, <laughs> I can't even listen to rap. You know what? I started listening to Tanzanian hip hop because I love hip hop, but I can't handle the misogynistic lyrics. So I listen to it in foreign languages. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Another story that really um, got to me was a couple had b- both been drinking. He, I guess he he had a history of beating her and probably had that night. But he called uh, he called her in and they had to arrest her even though she'd been the abused one. That bothered me. And the other part of that was the description that the kids just sit glassy eyed. Is that a typical yeah. kind of? Th- That's a typical kind of thing. Yeah, I Ugh. had I actually was on that call with the police. Um, that was in the state of Montana, and it was it was shocking to me because you know all the police officers gather around these kids, and there's like six or eight of them. And you know, police officers when they have all their vests and all their like stuff on, they're just big and intimidating figures, right? They're almost like superheroes to a child. And it's one o'clock in the morning. The kids are up, and they're wandering around and. Ugh. They're just immune to what's going on in front of them, as if they've seen it so many times, it doesn't even register. To me, it was it was the the dead eyes of trauma. Like that's how it's. I, I can still see those kids today, like Ugh. right now, as I sit here talking to you. So you're and, you're you're in the house with them, and you see this this woman has been beaten, and she's going to be the one arrested. Yeah, I mean, I'm in a drive. I was with the, I was with the police that night doing a drive along. Yes. And, you know, the call came over the radio, and I, I think our car was maybe the second there. And the police officer I was with was actually really, really nice. And he said to me, like, you know, you can get out of the car if you stay out of the way, which normally you're not allowed to do. And so I got out of the car, and none of the police officers were engaging with her at all. She's in, she's in handcuffs, but she's just standing there. And they had taken him, uh, the guy who had called, sort of, you know, away from her, and they're questioning him, and they're – None of them, when I got there anyway, are talking to her. And she clearly thought that I was connected to the police somehow, even though I'm in plain clothes and I have a notebook and my uh-huh. pen with me. And she just starts talking to me and she's crying and she's, you know. And so I just start going through, like, the danger assessment with her. I say, has he beat you before? Oh, so many times, so many times. Has he threatened your life? Oh, so many times. Has he, you know, ever threatened to commit suicide? Oh, all the time. Ugh. And so, you know, here it is, like, danger assessment, just checking off one thing after another. But because he's the one who called the police, and she's the, she is the one who's determined to be the primary aggressor that night, and she gets arrested. Uh, we don't have much time left, but I want to ask this question, because I, um, Ray Rice, the NFL, um, sort of threw him out of the league, it appears like. But you said he ended up not, the charges of uh, violence, domestic violence ended up getting thrown out and there's a misunderstanding between batterer intervention and anger management. What does that mean? Yeah, absolutely. He got, I think, 12 weeks of anger management. I mean, that speaks to a judge who does not understand that that domestic violence is not about anger. It's about power and control. And batterer's intervention, which is usually to be effective uh, somewhere around a year long, is not the same as anger management. It's, it speaks to such a deep misunderstanding of the psychology of anger management. You know, Ray Rice isn't out there beating up his coach or beating up his teammates when he gets mad. He, he, he does that to one person and one person only, Interesting. or maybe his, his immediate family members. And, you know, the NFL, I, I have a, a friend who was on the domestic violence commission for the NFL and resigned as a form of protest because as she put it, they didn't, they're not taking any of this seriously. No, they never do. You're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell right here on 1540 AM WADK Newport, All Talk. She's an expert in domestic violence. Her name is Rachel Louise Snyder, a professor at American University, written a chilling book on domestic violence. What we don't know about domestic violence can kill us. Her 
We're back with Rachel Louise Schneider. She's written No Visible Bruises, What We Don't Know About Domestic Violence Can Kill Us. You've done a lot of study of perpetrators here, which is fascinating too. But before you do what is the biggest predictor of, um, of, of this kind of abuse? Uh, of abuse or of domestic violence? Domestic violence. Homicide. Yeah, domestic violence domestic- homicide. I, I mean, the, most, the, the number one predictor, and it's, it's going to be like, oh, duh, is uh, prior domestic violence. That's the number one predictor. If you, if you go to the Danger Assessment website, which is dangerassessment.org, it gives you, anyone can look at this. If, if you're concerned about someone that you know, it might be a good website to have. Mm-hmm. Um, but it gives you the top 20 highest risk indicators for domestic violence homicide or predictors for domestic violence homicide. And the very top one is, prior acts of domestic violence. But among the top ones are uh, strangulation, access to a gun, um, children in the home that are not the biological, uh, the abuser's children biologically, uh, beatings while pregnant, um, threats of suicide is a big one. Uh, Let me ask you, um, well, first off, I found interesting the uh, highest per capita gun ownership states have the highest domestic violence murder rates. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I mean, who would have guessed, right? Yeah. And, and you know, a, a sort of corollary to that, and one of the reasons I, when, when I go to my, my re, when I go do readings now, I say, you know, domestic violence is not a woman's problem. It's a men's problem. You know, we're not, we're not beating ourselves. We're not strangling ourselves. Um, but the jurisdictions where they have lowered the homicide rates of men are the ones that have much better programs for domestic violence victims to get out of their situations, their abusive situations safely. That fact blew my mind. I was like, wow, more men actually stay alive when we put resources into domestic violence this, programming. This also blew me away that uh, over 50% of mass shootings are related to domestic violence. And of course, the big one right here in our state was in Newtown, um, in, in, in the, the Lanza Kid, um, shooting yeah. in uh, the elementary yeah. school. Oh, yeah. And, you know, um, I, I have to say, I was in Costa Rica when I heard about that, and I, ju- I had such a shock reaction. My, whole, my body just shook as if, as if I was standing right next to where that happened. I had my little daughter with me, and mm-hmm. I, just, I just cried and cried and cried. And, you know, I had a woman at a, at a reading in Boston a couple of weeks ago, and she came up to me and she said, in your book, the statistic is 54% of mass shootings are domestic violence homicide. Not that they predict it or that they're connected to it, but that they are, right? So Adam Lanza, to cite your example, began with his mother before he went to the school. Um, but she said she had done research that she was just about to publish that found that that statistic was much, much higher, really? actually. So I'm sort of waiting so for So in, in a sense, the mass part of it is a cover-up? No, I don't think it's a cover-up. I think that it is, I think, first of all, that most mass shootings are not, we think of Newtown, we think of, right. you know, Orlando Pulse, but in fact, most mass shootings are, um, that are domestic violence homicide, that 54% that I cite in my book, are ones that never even make the national news. Or if they do, they might make it for a day. So these are ones that, for example, in Wisconsin, a couple of years ago, there was a shooting at a spa. And the guy, the guy had gone there to shoot his, to kill his wife, and then he killed um, a number of other employees who were at the spa as well. She was there as a client. Or in Chicago, I think it was in, it was in 2018, I think, where um, the ex-boyfriend, the abusive ex-boyfriend of, of a doctor went and shot her and then shot some of her colleagues at a hospital in Chicago. Those, those are technically mass shootings. Four or more people is a mass shooting. But they're domestic violence homicide shootings in that... They, the, 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 the shooter has gone to target one person, and then other bystanders have been killed in the, in the melee. Can domestic uh, violence abusers, and particularly the ones that, that may end up uh, committing murder, can they become nonviolent? What is your, all of your study uncovered? Yeah, that's one, of the, that's one of the big questions I had. And, I, you know, can a domestic violence, a potential perpetrator of homicide become nonviolent? You know, I don't know. Research, research, it's always difficult to prove a negative with research. But I will say this. There's a number of offender interventions going on around the country. There's, you know, 2,000 different programs. They have varying efficacy, and they're new. 
say as as a social science, you know, domestic violence, the origins of domestic violence, meaning the violence itself, is has only been around since maybe the late eighties, right? So in terms of a social science, we're still in the infancy stages. But one of the programs that I sat in on was in this jail in San Francisco uh, called uh, San Bruno Jail, and the program was called Resolve to Stop the Violence. And it yes. was different than other programs because it was a year long, um, and it was five days a week, like six hours a day. Most batter intervention programs are like 40 weeks long for two hours a week. So it was much more intensive. But researchers went in from NYU, went in and and studied the program and then studied the recidivism rates and the efficacy rate. And they found that for men who had gone through the entirety of the program, who didn't drop out or get released before the year was up, recidivism dropped by 85%. Pretty amazing. Amazing, yeah. And, you know, I had one of the guys from that group say to me, one of the things they do is called a separation cycle exercise where they... They talk in the group about a moment of violence, and then they spend the next few hours with the facilitators and the, their peers um, deconstructing that moment of violence. So they look at what they what they felt like. They look at how their blood pressure increased and their muscles tense and their voice got louder. And, and one guy said to me that he learned in that exercise that he stepped into violence. He would feel this happening in his body, and then he would take a step toward his wife and hit her or punch her or whatever, Right. And he said the thing that he learned to do was when that happened in his body, he just took a step back instead of a step forward. And that hmm. small thing was enough to, like, re-trigger his mind to be like, okay, stop. You're about to get violent. Stop. Are these... And I, Go ahead. I found Go that ahead. amazing. No, I just found it really amazing, you know? They, they say hurt people hurt people. Are these... Is there some criteria? I mean, addiction, poverty. Can, what, what is it that, um, that 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 sort of drives these folks? Well, I mean, certainly for the for the overwhelming um, number of men who are in prison today, they have been either the, uh, sexually assaulted as children, or they've been victims or witness to domestic violence. Really, children in their in their homes. So yeah, the, so cycle, the, the cycle, repeat, the cycle, the cycle repeats itself, even though Absolutely. they, they the suffer. Absolutely, repeating itself. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. And, that, you know, you bring up poverty, you bring up addiction, like these things are all, none of these things operate in silos, right? I, I mean, right. domestic violence is doesn't stand alone. You cannot treat um, domestic violence without treating other forms, other social crises and social ills that we face as a nation, like homelessness, like mental health issues, like like poverty, right? So none of these things exist by themselves. And we, I think... We want our stories to be very neat, right? Mm -hmm. We want the good guys to be good and the bad guys to be bad. And in fact, victims' lives are very often messy. They're very often, they very often have addiction issues or poverty issues themselves, right? In the same way that perpetrators um, may have really amazing relationships with some people, right? Maybe someone, I mean, I had a guy talk to me endlessly about how much he loved his grandmother and how much he respected his grandmother while he's beating his wife. So people are messy, all of us. Do you find that these perpetrators um, are sort of find their ways to a certain profile of women? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I had a guy in my book tell me that he would look for girls who didn't have father figures in their lives, that he consciously did that, and he tried to get them to pimp for him and stuff. He works... He's a facilitator now in this anti-violence program. I think that he's probably more in tune. It was it, like he may, I, I wonder how much he consciously was aware of that, but certainly girls who are very, very young are vulnerable. This is one of the reasons that re the research tells us to start education in middle school with like 11 and 12 year olds. And Michelle and Rocky are, are just one of many examples of my book, right? And Nicole she's Simpson and OJ for that matter. Yeah, she, that's right. I she was 18. Was. Yeah. She was young, 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 yeah. yeah. And Michelle and Rocky, she was 14 and he was 24. I mean, it's it's very common. Why would Rocky, that mentality, he's 24 years old. It's, so is he sort of subconsciously attracted to someone that's 14 because of the control issues? Oh, yeah. Okay. Sure. I think absolutely. I think, and, and also even what you said earlier, like the insecurity. I think, you know, 
he would go yeah. he would go with very young women because he was insecure because he didn't have a sense of himself as an adult and and later on even his parents told me that they recognized that she just outgrew him so even you know he was 32 or 33 when he killed himself she was 23 but she was in terms of her maturity level and her intellectual her her intellectual approach to the world she apparently had had really um lapped him you're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell right here on 1540 AM WADK Newport. All talk. Final segment coming right up. This is expert in domestic violence, Rachel Louise Snyder. Tell us some of the ways that Domestic violence is being combating some of the new reforms. I know there's lethal, uh, lethality assessment program, high risk teams, family, family justice centers. What are the, some of the things that you think are most effective? I think the most effective solutions are, are oftentimes very small solutions, like holding an abuser until the afternoon so domestic violence advocates can can get to a victim and create a safety plan. That's just a very small solution that any jurisdiction can implement. But I think I would answer that, I would answer more broadly two ways. The most successful, whatever the programming is, and there are all kinds of, of different organizations that work with this across the country, but the ones that are most successful are the jurisdictions where police officers, the courts, and domestic violence advocacy groups have knocked down the sort of cultural uh, barriers between them, and they work together. So police, for example, um, really want to feel generally like they are helping people in their community. So if they have, if they're on site on a, on a terrible call and they've, you know, they've got a victim who is freaked out and and, in a terrible situation, they want to be able to know that they can call someone right then at three o'clock in the morning or whatever it is, and and they can get an advocate on the phone. So jurisdictions where they've connected those sort of bureaucratic silos, the police, the courts, and the uh, advocacy groups. So just as in, in 2017, we began to see more and more women talking about things that had happened to them with the Me Too movement, and particularly, I think, galvanized around the Kavanaugh hearings, where suddenly uh, women are having conversations with, you know, their husbands, their brothers, their male colleagues, their fathers, myself included, about events that happened in their lives. I think we need to do the same thing for domestic violence. I think we can get very complacent because we as individuals don't control policy and don't control legislation legislators. But what we do control are the conversations that happen in our homes. And I think we really need to normalize conversations around domestic violence. Uh, the judicial process and the focus is around incidents, right? Not patterns. So it's escalation often gets missed. Is that something that needs to be fixed in the court system? Or? That is another. That is another great point. You really did read the book. I can hear it. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, there there are not national statistics on this, but some states keep track of the number of women who are imprisoned for retaliatory violence against their abusers, meaning they killed their husbands to get out of an abusive situation. Hmm. And there are some states like New York that keep those records, and it's more than fifty percent of women wow. in in prison. So. Absolutely, we need to be able to 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 educate our our um, our judges and our our prosecutors on what the context of domestic violence means because it's different than other crimes. You know, it's not a single event and it's not a stranger. It's someone that you share a life with, and that that makes all the difference. Well, you also say in the book that France and the UK. Um, have something you can be charged with coercive control without any, any domestic violence incident itself. What does that mean? Yes, uh, um, and Ireland now too. So that would be an example of you know Rocky Mosier, for example, taking his kid to a motel and not telling his wife where they were. Right, like using them to bait her and using them to coerce her. So that's an example of coercive control. And so um, he's not physically abusing her, but he is emotionally abusing her with those actions. And so, yes, France, the U.K., Ireland all have coercive control laws now. And, in fact, California and New York are talking about um, putting forth coercive control laws now. Somebody, Nobody has done it yet, but they're, they're, 
they have been present their lawmakers have been presented so we'll see if it's something that can pass here do you um when you i don't know if you're on your book tour or doing interviews or whatever do, have you found that people uh you've connected with people um who are living in fear to some extent but don't really know what the first step is and what you what, what do you tell them you know i've had more of that um people who have written to me like through my website or through my publisher right i think that they don't come see me in public because first of all readings happen at night so mm-hmm. they're probably not allowed to leave very often but i i also think they're scared uh-huh. so i have had a couple of incidents i had a woman in well actually, i don't want to say where it was but um there was a she was telling me her her story at the signing table where i was signing books mm-hmm. and there just happened to be a local domestic violence agency there as well and I didn't know it, but one of the advocates was listening to her story. And, oh, my God, I will be forever grateful to that advocate because she stepped in and said, we're a local domestic violence advocacy group. Like, come over here and talk to me. And that is the power of, I think, this this moment. And I really, really encourage domestic violence agencies to, like, come to my readings, bring literature, like, pass it out. Because I don't know what the local systems are and who the local players are, but mm-hmm. I, I would love to be like a resource for people to, or a connector, as Malcolm Gladwell might call me from his first book, The Tipping Point. So I have had people, but I've had a lot of people send me emails, and I'm still sort of trying to figure out how to answer all of them because I because of all these reasons. <laughs> I, th- I think that your book um, should be part of these programs that are in prison and stuff for you know for folks to read as part of the um, you know try to reform. The, uh, the violence, because this, you read I think the, the, so, too. Yeah, the book is... I think so, too. The New York um, uh, City uh, Police Department bought 500 copies for all their detectives to read. You know, I also thought the, at the end of the book, you talked about your stepmother and your father, and it's really symbolic of the whole issue that she uh, didn't talk about abu- being abused for 38 years, and your dad didn't feel like he was allowed to cry. And that's, that really yeah. sums up America, doesn't it? It really does. It really does. She was abused in her first marriage, and I never knew it. It was shocking to me. And, um, yeah, that's why the book is dedicated to her, because her story was so hard for her to tell. And um, so I'm her conduit. And, 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 and your father, and I guess a lot of men, just feel like that is some sort of weakness if you cry. Yeah. As a person. Yeah, absolutely. And, in fact, I showed him that, that author's note before. You know, I wanted to make sure it was okay with him before I wrote that. Yeah. And he, he cried when he read it, and then he said, he said, I'm sorry, and he stopped himself, and he said, no, I'm not, I'm not sorry. And I thought, yeah, you know yeah. what, he's 80 years old, but he can change, it's okay, you know? What do you think of the book? And, you know, I don't know, I don't know if he's ready yet, I don't want to ask. <laughs> I don't want to put him on the spot. <laughs> well, you've done an, an amazing uh, piece of work here, because it really is chilling, and uh, my, my guess is that most of these domestic violence abusers are not very... Um, uh, in you know, uh, intuitive or, or able to look inside themselves. So to read this kind of stuff really must, you know, really, in my mind, would really open their eyes to what they're doing. They may not really have any, ins- any, any insight into what's driving them, right? I think that's true. I think that they do not want to be considered violent, and they don't want to be in violent situations. There's a reason that that domestic violence RSVP wing at the jail has a waiting list, and the reason is, People don't naturally choose violence as a way of life, generally speaking. Thanks to Rachel Louise Snyder. That book again is No Visible Bruises. What we don't know about domestic violence can kill us. You've been listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell right here on 1540 AM WADK. Mondays through Friday, 1 to 2, right here. We'll see you for our next edition of Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Thanks, everybody, for listening.